technology plays a key role in、uh, making financial inclusion、uh, possible. Digital mechanisms have given us an opportunity to really leapfrog what it will take many years to achieve. The game changer was the advent of digital financial services. The new technology definitely lowers the barrier of entry to the financial services sector, as well as substantially broaden the access to ordinary consumers to basic financial services. By using mobile technology, by using cloud computing and big data, it can really bring the inclusive financial service to more people. If there's no risk, probably there is no innovation. Financial innovation is a laudable objective, but innovation without supervision is a formula for disaster. It's a small change on the surface, paying your supplier by mobile phone, but when you've never had a bank account, it makes life safer and more convenient. Anaza kaibiwa, umpe hiyo cash, alafu nda safili ya peleke mpaka kule, na wendo upate mzigo. Lakini kwa sasa, mekua laisi sana. Mobile network operators shook up the Tanzanian market almost overnight with a simple but revolutionary financial product, payments over the mobile phone. In the competition between the country's M&Os, mobile money is the main battleground, and the regulator has watched closely as they fight it out. When we started with the process of digital financial services, we did not have concrete regulatory framework. So we had guidelines, and we allowed the market to move on. The regulators in Tanzania were quite open-minded. They allowed the MNOs to have a license to introduce these financial services. In the beginning, transfers could only be sent to those using the same network provider, but the central bank said that agents shouldn't be tied to one mobile operator. Mr. Mdoe Ali, who is an agent, you know, people come to him to deposit or to withdraw. These agents are not exclusive; they welcome every provider. The next phase was for the mobile operators to agree the rules that would allow e-money to be transferred from wallet to wallet across providers. Tanzania is the first country for mobile financial services to interoperate. Interoperability, in a very simple way, means that. Customers can push wallet, e-wallets, e-value among themselves, regardless of the subscribers where they belong. Previously, this was not the case. Today, interoperability allows all these transactions, all these people here, to transact among themselves. This has been a huge change. About 10% of all transactions now take place across networks, but the bigger change is still to come. Next five years in Tanzania is the expansion of interoperability. It will move from mobile network operators, but it will also go to banks and it will open up an entire ecosystem. As the markets matured, mobile operators and banks have begun to cooperate to offer a wider range of digital financial products. Empower is a partnership between Vodacom and the Commercial Bank of Africa. It connects the M-Pesa payment system to a simple bank account, where customers can earn interest on savings. And access small amounts of credit instantly through the mobile phone. Leonard uses it to save and borrow small amounts as he builds his IT business in Kariakou. If you want to meet those conditions of of being eligible to borrow from them, you must be saving as well. So they track you are saving trends with your borrowings. Demand is high. Five million Tanzanians borrowed nearly twenty million dollars from Empower in just two years. And other mobile operators like Tigo and Airtel have partnered with regulated institutions to offer digital credit over the phone. They can get it, you know, as and when. It's just a blink of an eye. It's just a second by, you know, pushing a button. Lucas Hindu uses Tigo credit to buy nets and equipment for his boat. Muda mungu ni takuani tumi e ufatiri hara maswala mpaka kujua kupata mkopo muda ule na fanya kazi na kujipatia kipato. Mobile loans are booming. But as more gain access, protecting and empowering Tanzanian consumers will be critical. The challenge now for regulators is to put the necessary regulation to ensure soundness of the system, but also to protect the consumers. It's happening very fast, to the speed of the understanding and the capabilities of consumers. So that's where we really need to put more of our effort. The types of people that we are talking about are not the ones that may necessarily have the powers to negotiate. And if they can't trust these mechanisms, they will not be able to use them. And if they don't use them, the impact may not be achieved.
Nowhere has mobile exploded and at such scales in China. Everywhere you look, there's a smartphone. With it, internet finance, the name they use here for digital financial services, has become a way of life. Mobile is used to pay for anything and everything. Alipay, the payments platform that grew out of the Alibaba Group's e-commerce sites, and its competitors like WeChat and Baidu, have spawned a whole series of mobile financial services. Internet technology is opening up new possibilities. If done properly, they could really promote uh, financial inclusion in broadening access to credit, access to equity financing. Payments and storing value electronically hasn't only made life more convenient. For poor consumers and small business owners, the ability to smooth income and expenditure may be transformational. Dujo Bao sells pancakes for a living. Customers pay using a range of apps, and at the end of each day, he transfers his profits with just one click of a button into Yue Bao, a money market fund connected to his Alipay account. He's not alone in valuing higher returns, instant liquidity, and how easy it is to use. Yuibao is the fastest growing mutual fund of all time, anywhere. By the end of June, it boasted almost $115 billion in assets and 300 million investors, more than the combined total of all other Chinese asset managers. And one in seven users are from rural China. Over 20 million of people, every day in the morning, they will log on to uh, Anipi apps, they will check how much return they get. It takes less than half an hour for Wen Jun to apply for a 10,000 yen loan. And it's approved almost instantly. But this isn't a bank loan. The money is coming from ordinary people who've invested online using one of thousands of P2P platforms that have emerged in China in the last few years. The past three to five years, we have seen explosive growth because the market really needs it. Credit uh, uh, needs are uh, uh, very uh, uh, strong. And uh, uh, when institutions uh, didn't actually uh, serve them, uh, this P2P marketplace model uh, was able to uh, serve them. P2P or marketplace lending has been growing at a dizzying pace, making China the largest P2P market in the world. It's still small compared to banking, but P2P and online lending is up more than tenfold over the past two years. When you have seen an explosive kind of uh, growth, as a regulator will be both encouraged and alarmed. The banking and the, the traditional lines of uh, finance, they are, they are all regulated. But um, some of the new uh, emergent forms of internet finance, they are not properly regulated or even unregulated. So that definitely creates a lot of risk and we need to take prompt actions to address these problems. Hong Bin Zheng is a student of finance. He does his homework and he thinks he knows the risks. But he worries that some investors don't know what they're getting into. I have some knowledge to handle this. But I think ordinary people, they should take only a small proportion of their money in P2P. Yeah, that's the right choice. Investor education and uh, consumer protection are a key to uh, uh, industry uh, success. These are not regulated banks. They are not protected by deposit insurance. So you can lose money. Millions may be investing and borrowing with online marketplace lenders. But early morning in Chaoyang Park, they're not risking their pensions. Too many highly publicized cases of fraud have scared them off. More than a third of the 4,000 P2P platforms launched in recent years have collapsed. I don't think P2P or equity crowdfunding or internet finance will go away. But if we don't pay close attention to bad cases, yeah, fraud cases, then the progress may be delayed. I think 
As marketplace lending and internet finance grows, the regulators have begun to step in. The new engines, they came without supervision, without a licensing requirement. It's important to close that loophole. You have to have a level playing field. So that's why we started setting up a proper regulatory framework for internet finance. The internet finance guidelines are just the beginning. It's clear there'll be more to come from the regulators as they work with the innovators to understand the risks and chart the future of global finance. It's important for the regulators to catch up to ensure potential risks are fully covered. There shouldn't be loopholes, gaps. As long as you have the dynamism in the market, there will always be a need to understand the products and how best they can be supervised and regulated. In the next 10 years, we want to serve 2 billion people globally. I see a more comprehensive, more inclusive financial system driven by technology, driven by innovative business model, driven by smart regulation, really powers the growth of the country, really powers the growth of millions of small businesses and micro-entrepreneurs. We have reached a point of no return. We need now to shift the country from access to usage. And that is how I think we'll bring more impact. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Digital Banking for Financial Inclusion, a step change. Two of my speakers are here. Maria will be joining a little bit later, I hope. Um, Salim Hussein is the Managing Director and CEO of Brack Bank Limited, one of the fastest growing banks in Bangladesh with a particular focus on the SME segment with a market capitalization close to about US um, $1 billion. Salim joined Brack Bank in November 2015 and has led uh, the bank to be amongst the top 60 banks in the Bangladesh banking sector. Welcome to Salim. Greta Bull is the CEO of CGAP, an independent think tank housed within the World Bank focused on financial inclusion of the poor in emerging markets. Greta has about 18 years worth of experience in development finance, focusing on small and medium-sized enterprise finance, microfinance, and digital financial services. She's worked with both financial service providers and policymakers in Latin America, Central and Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia. Her clients have included banks, microfinance institutions, mobile network operators, and fintechs. I'm very excited to have the both of you on. We do have a translation capability. You will see the Zoom link. Um, please click that if you need translation um, into Spanish and make sure that you turn the volume down so that you can hear your translators. Um, so my big question for this section is, why is this the need of the hour? Welcome to Salim and Greta. Thank you. Hello to both of you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So tell us, why do you think digital financial inclusion <clears throat> is, is the need of the hour? Well, um, Kia, you know, it's, it's been well researched and empirically proved that uh, there is a very strong correlation between social and economic development and access to financial services particularly broader financial services. In a country like Bangladesh, for example, although there is no absolutely clear research, um, generally it is accepted that anything between 40 to 50 percent of the adult population, <clears throat> excuse me, do not have access to financial services, uh, banking services in particular. And although over the last six or seven, maybe eight years, um, uh, payments and purchases through mobile financial services such as Vcash and Rock, Rocket and Nogod, which are uh, M-Pesa uh, uh, type services, have proliferated. The fact is that banking services themselves are still uh, uh, concentrated in the larger metros and small towns and villages uh, do not have this uh, uh, these access to these services. 
So that is very, very important for countries like ours, for example, which are just trying to transition from an LDC status to more, a more developing status. It is absolutely imperative that people of all income stages are able to get access to banking services. What do you think it's important for Brack Bank for, to do in order to to have that financial inclusion, given that, you know, in, in most parts of the world, there is a minimum sum that is required to even maintain an, a, an open, um, you know, bank account? Yeah, that's where um, technology and in particular digital technology comes in. The biggest challenge for the banking sector is that um, how do we make it commercially uh, profitable or viable to be able to bank lower income groups? Um, and over the last few years, there have been many initiatives. There have been initi initiatives such as agent banking, which was spawned in South America many, many years ago. Um, but very importantly, the cost of banking has to be reduced. We have to learn to move away from bricks and mortar and offer um, technology-based services which are much cheaper. Unless we are able to do that uh, individually as institutions and collectively as, as the banking sector, we will not be able to offer banking services to people who want to maybe uh, open a bank account with, with $50 or $100 and who do not have incomes more than two or $300 a month. And unless we are able to provide that kind of services, we will be limited to um, or restricted to the larger metros and um, middle class or upper middle class income groups. So that is mm. very, very important that we find solutions. And uh, it's very clear the solutions are all technological or digital in nature. That's fascinating, especially in terms of Bcash. Um, give us a little bit of, you know, uh, an appreciation for what happened in the first month of you launching. Absolutely. I mean, Bcash uh, has been there for about six or seven years now, and it has uh, more than 40 million um, um, users. Half of them are active users. Uh, Bcash started off with what we call a USSD uh, solution on feature phones because many low income uh, participants were not able to purchase um, um, uh, smartphones. So it ran on feature phones for, for the first 80% uh, of its lifespan. But a couple of years ago, we launched a, an app. And initially, we were very apprehensive as to whether Vikash's um, uh, uh, members or subscribers or account holders would be using the app. And then very quickly, we, we were astonished that more than a million subscribers joined up to this new app in just the first month itself. And that's where we learned that just because people are perhaps less educated or are, uh, are in income groups uh, which are different from those in the cities, are lower than those in the cities, does not mean that they will not take on good services. So the Bikash app was a beautiful app, very, very user friendly, both in English and Bangla. It, it, anybody can use it. It's so simple. And it caught on like wildfire. So uh, that's when we realized that um, people in our country just want good service, good financial services. And if you can offer that through uh, mobile, mobile is, you know, there are over 80 million mobiles in the country today. If you can offer it through mobile banking services, then it's going to catch on very, very quickly. And Bcash has been uh, absolutely unbelievable with close to 70 75 percent market share in the last few years that's incredible and you know hats off to you for the effort that you put into that i mean you know if we were to sort of zoom out greta and bring you in here um what would you say was the sort of the high level overview of what's happening in different regions across the world and and why do you think that's sort of plugging into the, the, the greater dialogue here? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so, you know, the development of digital financial services has actually been really heterogeneous across different markets. So if you look at Africa, mobile network operators or MNOs really drove that change. They played a big role in some parts of Asia. In Bangladesh, it was sort of a mashup between um, a financial institution and a uh, 
what we would call a fintech now. Um, in China, it was driven by e-commerce and social media. Um, in India, it's been driven by public policy and really public-private partnerships. In Indonesia, they solve for cash and cash out with ride-hailing companies. So we've we've seen sort of many different pathways to getting to having digital rails, and now we're seeing sort of the proliferation of fintech solutions in multiple markets. Um, and there's no one recipe for success, basically, but you have to have the digital rails to ride the service on, right? And, and there are factors that are common in all of those markets that I mentioned. So the first is cash in, cash out, which is absolutely foundational. So poor people live largely in the analog economy. They use cash. Um, and and onboard them to a digital service, you need a way for them to convert their cash into digital money and back into cash again. Uh, and so everything from M-Pesa to um, Bcash, to Alibaba, Gojek, they all started with that need to digitize and digitize the cash. The second is you needed mobile connectivity and a store of value account. So uh, all of these services have some sort of store of value. They Many of them started with USSB, just as Bcash did. Now many of them are moving to app-based services. But you have to have a place where you can store and move digital money from and a way of, of connecting. And, you know, for something that Salim said earlier, it's no accident that the companies who took, who took this role on for banks were good at two things. They were good at distribution and they were good at billing. So a mobile network operator is basically a giant distribution of billing machine. A bank can't go out and serve poor customers en masse. They just don't have the capacity to do it and the money in the account's not big enough. So what an MNO does is they consolidate that money into one account and they manage the billing for them, right? Um, the third thing you need, and, and this was shown in the video actually, is as the ecosystem grows, you need interconnectivity. Um, and, and that becomes increasingly important as platform plays begin to develop. So you need things like interoperability, as was the case in Tanzania in, in the video. You need things like open APIs so different systems can connect and talk to each other. And then the fourth common thread in all of these markets is data. So the ability to understand both customer demand, um, where the service is needed uh, and what the risks are is pretty core to any of these services. And the ability to structure and use data is going to be a pretty key comparative advantage in the digital economy. And then once you have those kind of rails, so cash in, cash out, um, connectivity in a store of value, an interconnected system and data flowing through it, you can layer on lots of other services and various participants can play. So in the video was mentioned digital credit, that's a third party providing that service. You can pay your bills, you can buy things online. And so once you have that infrastructure, a whole bunch of other services can layer on top of it. I'm super keen to kind of get your both of your perspectives actually on um, post pandemic or, or during pandemic actual, you know, success factors. So what have been some of the success stories that you've seen coming out of the uh, the situation of the pandemic? And how have you met those challenges with services or products or policy? Salim, you first. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Very, very relevant too right now. Um, what the pandemic has done in our country, in Bangladesh, um, is, is it significantly accelerated the entire digital agenda across the country in every sphere, in banking, in, in retail, in wholesale, in government, in business, uh, in, the, in, in, in the courts even. That is the one, I think, very positive aspect of the pandemic, the fact that we've been able to change very, very quickly. And the change has been brought about by customer behavior. That has changed very, very significantly. And it's not just with young people. It is with senior citizens, people over 50, over 60. Uh, their attitudes, their behavior has changed as well. They no long, longer, for example, from a banking perspective, want to come out and go to shops and go to bank branches, etc. They want to be able to do a lot of what they used, used to do earlier uh, through analog means or physically visiting branches. Now they want to be able to do that on their laptops, in their homes or through their mobiles. That change, that cultural change, behavioral change um, was what has already spurred many institutions to start changing their in infrastructures, quickly building services for them. Of course, it can't be done overnight. So uh, banks like Brack Bank, which had started this digital transformation journey a few years earlier, 
are pretty much in at the head of the queue. And for example, we will be launching a banking app within a month's time, and it will be offered to over 1.5 million Brack Bank customers very quickly. But that's just one solution that we're offering. We we have a raft of different solutions for our corporate clients, for our commercial clients, for our SME clients, cash management, basic banking, payments, et cetera, et cetera, different kinds of solutions. And it's what's great to see is that the regulators have also caught on to this very, very quickly. And in terms of the Credit Information Bureau, in terms of EKYC regulatory reform, in terms of um, connectivity, integration between the various players, the banks, the mobile financial services, uh, PSPs, etc. everybody, those services, those re reforms, the regulations are already in place. And everybody is running like mad now to quickly catch up because we recognize that the customer has moved ahead. Their wants have changed in less than a year. How can everybody else respond to that? And if you don't respond, you're going to be uh, very quickly a dinosaur. Yeah, would you like me to come in on this one too? Yeah. Um, so, you know, in addition to what Salim said, we have seen a massive shift to digital. It was happening before, but the pandemic has just accelerated it in every market in the world because people wanted to get away from cash and they could go out. Um, I think the two things I would add on to what Salim said is there was a massive use of um, payments infrastructure by governments that were keen to get money into the hands of low income people. So we saw big efforts in places like Kenya, Peru, India, of course. In India, they got over 200 million payments out to low income households in very short order, very efficiently. And so having that digital infrastructure in place was really crucial to being able to help people during the pandemic. I think the other thing that's been really important is businesses going online, right? So we're seeing a big uptick in e-commerce and social commerce, people selling online because they can't um, go to the shop. And so there's been a, a big surge in e-commerce activity as well. So I think all of these changes, and, and Salim was talking about some of the things that need to be solved for um, to get people online, those are being accelerated because they had to. So a lot of the regulatory impediments are, are being moved along. Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, can you hear me now? Yep. OK, fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to feel the question from the audience, if I may. And that is, can you tell us more about the lessons that, that you've learned um, about how to manage the cultural changes in banks that are necessary, given that we have the obvious benefits of technology? Um, either of you, whoever wants to go first. Well, Salim can speak about it um, very specifically from Frack Bank, but I, I've sort of seen this transformation take place in a lot of other organizations, and it's it's a big change. It, it requires investment. It requires skills that often um, a lot of financial institutions don't have. And so Frack, I think, was in a really good starting position to sort of absorb this when it came along. I think there are a lot of other um, institutions that have had to scramble to catch up. And so what we saw with the pandemic was that if you had those rails in place that I was talking about before, you could really accelerate and sort of make things happen across the rails. The main sort of barriers would have been regulatory. Um, if you didn't have those rails in place, you were really in trouble. Uh, and so mm. we saw a lot of operators having to, you know, in one country we worked and we saw governments, you know, distributing cash to citizens from the back of a truck with the military. So um, the rails are pretty important. I think the um, we seem to have lost um, Salim, um, but um, let's carry on. We've only got a couple of more minutes and I'm dying to ask you some more questions. So what does it mean for, for values-based banking in terms of the kind of larger lessons that we can take away and the reflections from both the, the, the trends that you've seen, like you call them the rails, the trends that you've seen um, from you know, um, meeting the challenges of the pandemic, meeting the challenges of of climatic resilience. Uh, what would you say 
are the kind of the key sort of lessons for values-based banking? Yeah, I, I think the big lesson for banks is that you need to get on the digital train and you need to do it pretty quick because what we're seeing is, as I said, this kind of acceleration of digital. And with these rails in place, you now have competitors that you never thought you had as competitors before, right? So some, the video talked about digital credit. That is coming in and competing with a lot of micro lenders, for example. Um, but you also have over the top players like the big tech companies, like the Amazons, the Googles, et cetera, who wanna come in and provide both payments and credit services to mass market. And so that represents a little bit of a challenge for more traditional financial services providers, particularly if they aren't digitized. And so it, it sort of changes the playing field. And what we're starting to see in places um, like Europe and the UK, and I was on a call with Brazil and South Africa this morning, they're, they're looking at open banking regimes. So customers being in charge of their own data and being able to take it wherever they want. So that's going to really challenge traditional banking models. And I think banks would be well served to be ready for that kind of digital challenge. Welcome back, Salim. Can you tell us a little bit about how people are learning to use these services? And um, are the banks providing some sort of well-coordinated education on how to use these mobile money systems? Um, that was a question also from the audience. Salim, do you want to take that one? Sure. Can you hear me, Tia? Yes, perfectly. Um, um, my apologies. I got disconnected for a few minutes there. Um, so, yes, the um, change, behavioral change in customers, uh, we found out very early on needs to be responded with a similar behavioral change within organizations, within banks, because that is something we learned from um, um, uh, uh, a lot of banks that we visited over the last two or three years in, in South America, in Asia, in, 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 in Africa, etc. Because if, if uh, the employees within an organization are not able to uh, understand what digital banking services are, are like and how to serve customers properly, then you're not going to be able to do that. What it means is that you need to fine tune, you need to upskill uh, large groups of people, get them to start thinking differently, um, get them to use different skill sets. The focus on digital services, banking services is very different from what it was earlier, which is analog paper-based, face-to-face. Uh, -face. So it's a different way of finding out what the customer's needs, wants, feedback are, and how do you respond to that. So in many cases, we've had to not only upskill our own team members, but restructure the banks, uh, the service departments, customer experience, or customer experience enhancement departments, etc. Cetera, et cetera. It's a different ball game altogether. And if one thinks that one can operate the way one used to two years ago when in an analog environment, uh, then it's not going to work. That cultural change that is brought on by customer behavioral change has to be embedded in banks itself. If the banks do not embrace, and I'm talking of large groups of people within the banks, if they do not embrace this change to a new kind of banking service, then the entire uh, offering will fail. But we put yeah, it I completely hear that. Do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've, I, I've got two questions in from the audience, which I'm going to merge, if I may. Um, the first is, you know, where can artificial intelligence and other kind of emerging technologies um, enable financial inclusion? And the second is much more on the cryptocurrencies. Um, how can we use cryptocurrencies as a means to give access to more people? Greta, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to start with the crypto um, question. So it depends on what kind of cryptocurrencies you're talking about. I mean, Bitcoin is sort of used all around the world right now and people do have access to it. I would argue I don't see a lot of poor people necessarily having access to it, but it's particularly useful in places like Venezuela or Zimbabwe, where you have wild currency valuations because Bitcoin is all over the place in terms of valuation, right? It's not a traditional currency. And so it's stable if you're in Venezuela or Zimbabwe, not so much if you live in the United States or in Bangladesh. So it's it's a, it's a considered by most to be a security, not a currency. We are seeing a move towards central bank digital currencies and a lot of central banks are talking about introducing it. I think there are real questions about whether that meets the inclusion challenge, let's put it that way. There are big barriers to having 
poor people have access to digital wallets that enable them to use cryptocurrencies and there aren't acceptance networks to pay for things with those um, cryptocurrencies. So I think we still have a ways to go on making cryptocurrencies replace cash. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hear that. Salim. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, the next generation of banking services, once you move beyond basic payments and, and account opening and basic banking services, is to be able to provide um, superior credit scoring, for example. And that is completely uh, uh, dependent on uh, different technologies like algorithms and artificial intelligence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How do you understand your customer and their needs better? You need artificial intelligence there. You need your customer relationship management capabilities to be significantly enhanced. And that is totally dependent on those kinds of technologies. You need to be able to, as we saw in that video uh, a few minutes ago, you need to be able to respond to a customer's loan request very, very quickly. In Brack Bank, for example, uh, today, Tia, 53% of our customer assets of about $2 billion worth are currently located in what we call the SME segment. Unfortunately, it still takes us, because we're manual, paper, and analog, it takes us anything up to 10 working days to disburse a $30,000, $40,000 SME loan. Now, it, the only way to bring that down, bring it to maybe a day and then hopefully within a few minutes, is use technology, use a banking app, get to access the customer through his mobile and build the infrastructure or the rails that will support not only the customer application, but the maintenance of all that loan, the disbursement of the loan, the EMI repayments of the loan, all communication with the customer. And of course, initially, the entire credit assessment or underwriting process has to be overlaid on that particular loan request. And that too will be uh, based on algorithms and, and a superior credit scoring. So what we currently do through a credit and underwriter or with a piece of paper, um, that will be completely digitalized and the exercise will move into seconds. Yeah, and, and just to add to what Salim said, beyond that, you know, we have providers that aren't traditional banks coming into the finance space. So we have um, big tech providers, for example, you know, the Amazons, the Googles and the Facebooks of this world who are embedding financial services into their platform services. And so, you know, it's not the same as having a traditional bank relationship and applying for a loan and digging through paper to figure out whether that client is credit worthy, you know what they buy, you know what they sell online. And so it's very easy to offer um, appropriate financial services very quickly and understand the risk of that client very quickly. So I think we're going to start seeing financial services being provided by a completely different set of providers. And that's going to really change the game. And as I said before, what we're now starting to see is um, movement to actually empower customers with their own data so that they can take it to any financial services provider and and data providers being forced to kind of unlock that data. We're seeing that in a lot of markets. And that's incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. Because I think what we're seeing is this sort of like slew of digital products or digital capabilities, data, like we've never seen before, access to people in ways that we can actually really include them. And I'm and I'm curious to ask, um, you know, my final question really, and this is also from the audience, what challenges have we got on the operational and human resources sort of issues to make sure that even the rolling out of these kinds of technologies can be met with the, the skill sets and the specialists capabilities that, that will aid um, instead of deter the actual, you know, um, incoming of this kind of technology. One of the challenges, of course, is using all that data. But if you don't know what to do with that data, of course, that's not going to, to help you strategize and it may not help you redirect, um, you know, using that quant quantitative information to, to analyze where the best services and products are. Um, so where do you see the, the human elements meeting the digital? Either of you, join in, feel free. Oh, uh, so as far as banks are concerned, you're talking of enormous investments here. Um, step changes, structural changes, people changes, um, uh, a whole new perspective altogether. Um, uh, you know, we, we started off thinking, should we try to do this out of a separate legal entity or can we do it out of the same legal entity? We decided 
in our environment a hybrid bank one that is both high tech and high touch is what is required for our country uh, a kind of a neo bank is not going to work in in bangladesh therefore we need to integrate the the legacy bank the legacy technologies and our our people that we've had for the last 20 years into this new capability as well uh, we're not going to leave anybody behind yes we have lots of new people particularly in technology but other skill sets too um statistics um um, um uh, quant maths you know things like that areas like that you need people with who have specialization in in um, human centric design so these are concepts that are different that are new to the banks but if you don't take these on board very quickly you don't invest in it um uh, the end product isn't going to work what i also should mention here tia is very important that as banks take on these new technologies they are uh, very focused on how this is going to end up giving them value value for their uh, uh, stakeholders so our focus in terms of our digital transformation are very simple four clear objectives firstly um enhance customer experience that has to be there you cannot provide the same kind of customer uh, se uh, service that you did in the past number two reduce costs that has to be a significant uh, uh, priority uh, number three we need to access different geographies, different customer segments, be able to offer new services. And number four, the overall control infrastructure within the bank has to also be significantly upgraded, moving from the paper analog based solutions as we move into digital. So we are very clearly focused on in Brack Bank these four KPIs, and we have lots of metrics which measure these on a, on a monthly basis. Otherwise, institutions can invest millions of dollars and then not see any real output. So it's not just a cultural change. It's not just a people change and a technology change. I think you need enormous focus from management in terms of strategy and um, performance management to ensure all this is well integrated into the new organization few words to check out, Greta? Yeah, no, I think Salim's covered the challenges really well. And I think just to add to that, it, it is not a trivial undertaking. And I think BRAC is better able to sort of tackle this than many other um, financial institutions focused on the low income segment. Because remember, we're talking about the low income segment. There are not big margins here, right? And so I think it's a real challenge for the inclusive finance sector to do digital transformation, but they absolutely have to. And they've got to just start somewhere and get it done. But I think Celine covered the main aspects of it very well. Brilliant. And on time. Thank you, Greta and Salim. That was amazing. Um, great to have a conversation with you. The audience, thank you very much for your questions and keep them coming for the next upcoming sessions. Um, next up, I've, I'm quite excited um, that you will have the opportunity to gather um, around Banking 4.0, moderated by the CEO of Sunrise Banks, David Riding from us. Have a great time. Um, enjoy the show. Go and take a break and see you back here. Take care. Thank you. Thank great you. Bye-bye.